So thank you very much for, for coming to my podcast, Roland. I just wanted to double check with you. Uh, what is the general feelings among uh, Sabah lawyers? Uh, are they very passionate about MA63? It depends on who you are speaking to. Uh, but those that I speak, that I have spoken to, they are generally very, very supportive of this uh, MA63. But uh, most are not quite sure how to go about it. That's all. Sure, and that's the reason for this podcast. Uh, what is your your legal opinion? Uh, given that uh, you know some people are saying that perhaps we should follow the international route because MS is three is an international treaty, or some people argue that perhaps uh, it's better to sue the federal government via the, via the domestic laws. I think whichever route you take, there will be definite obstacles and problems. I'm not that familiar with the international route. But I'm of the view that uh, the international route will maybe a bit uh, more problematic because you are going to go out of your jurisdiction and uh, Sabah would not have that kind of uh, local standard. That, that's all about all I can say about that. But on the national courts itself, uh, there's enough uh, precedent to say that if you have a constitutional problem, you can bring it to the federal court. So, that so, would be so if you want to frame it in terms of a constitutional question, how would you frame it? I think that you have to frame it in terms of something which is very uh, specific in uh, the federal constitution for Sabah. Like for example, the 40% uh, revenue, net revenue, and then the, the question of about uh, uh, Sabah uh, rights over the sea, you know, and then also about the, the the question of uh, of the, the right to the fisheries and so on and so forth, something which is very specific and stated in inside the list for mm. Sabah, and uh, in that respect, why, why do you think these cases have not been filed yet other than as as far as away the modernization case? Other than that, uh, none of the other issues has been litigated before. Why, why do you think it has not been litigated? I'm not too sure why it has not been litigated, but my only guess is that nobody is willing to be a plaintiff. You see, in, in anything, you must have a willing plaintiff. You may have a very interesting issue, but do you have a plaintiff that is going to satisfy all the requirements for first the locus standi, and then you, if you get the leave, then you have to look at whether or not you will be able to satisfy the merits because normally the first thing that the opposing side, which is definitely going to be the Attorney General's office, they will try to knock you out on the local standard issue and on the question of merits. Because if you cannot pass the first stage of the leave, that's it. And this is what happened Even in the modernization case. They could not get through the local standard issue. Is, is, is that correct? I think for one, they got through, but then uh, for the other one, uh, they, they did not manage to get through. For the one which got through, the, the Attorney General appealed at the, federal, at the Court of Appeal and it was struck out on the issue of local standard, mm. that on, on the issue that you should have actually gone to the federal court. Mm. Mm. Uh, the High Court has no, I, uh, no jurisdiction to deal with the constitutional issues. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing that Sabah lawyers are, are quite concerned about, as I understand it, is that the issue of uh, uh, appointment of judicial commissioners, as you know, the law was changed and then uh, they took the powers away from Sabah and Sarah in terms of the appointments. Um, are you aware of this case and, and, and are there any moves currently in, in, within the Sabah legal fraternity to, to reverse this case to make sure that Sabah gets the powers back? Now, in that case, the Sabah TYT formally had the right to appoint judicial commissioners. Okay? There was one case of the late, uh, uh, one of the sessions court judges who was appointed uh, to be a high court judge for a period of six months. I think uh, he's the late Raymond Wong. And I think that was the only appointment that was made. But thereafter, that power was taken away and then uh, it has been, at, at the moment, it has been more or less taken over by the Judicial Appointments uh, Committee. 
And I think in that case, which I read, it says that uh, the Judicial Appointments Committee does not actually uh, take away that power and that in any case, the uh, Sabah TYT has given away that power. You know, he given his consent. I think both the TYT of Sabah and Sarawak signed the consent. That was the issue that was brought out. And I think that there was one case which the judge asked the parties to uh, submit on that point. And uh, the point was whether or not the TYT had actually granted consent. And uh, in both the cases, you know, in that, in that case, the, the judge says that, well, since the TYT has already given consent, that's why they didn't proceed with the case and the case was actually struck up. So what I'm hearing from you is that perhaps a lot of the so-called issues on autonomy or this sort of thing, the other side that is not widely known was that in fact, the governments of Sabah and Surat, whoever was in power at that time, actually gave up the, the power willingly. And therefore, it's, it's very difficult to get it back now. Is that what I'm hearing from you? No, there are some cases, okay, like the PDA that was not uh, given away uh, easily. Uh, the issue about the PDA is that it was signed by Datu Haris himself. Without going to the assembly. Correct. So there are some issues there. But so on issues like the PDA 74, the fact that uh, Datu Haris did not go to the they want to seek permission. How would you litigate something like that? You see, it depends, as I said, on your who is going to be your plaintiff. If your plaintiff is a normal citizen, you will have a problem. Because first of all, you have to go through the hurdle to make sure that you are not a busybody. You've got something linked to it. And then, what is the benefit that you're going to get from this? It cannot be something that, you know, which is very uh, vague. Because otherwise, the question that will come to you is, okay, suppose the court agrees with you and grants you the order. How are you going to enforce it? Mm. Because you are not going to be a recipient. It's the state government that's going to be the recipient. Mm. For example, if you go and deal with this, uh, uh, this uh, TYT appointment of judicial commissioners, how are you going to say, you, did you apply for the job? No, you didn't apply for the job. So how is it going to affect you? Then mm. you become what is known a busybody in law. You know, and you'll be kicked out on that basis. Now, the other thing that Sabahans, of course, are very concerned about was that a lot of people are unhappy even today about the, the, the giving away of the Lawan Island to the federal government. Is there any area of law where it can be litigated to bring the island back to Sabah sovereignty? Well, that is a very uh, tricky issue. But uh, the issue here is uh, any uh, giving away of uh, Sabah uh, property land, including the the, the blocks L and M, which was exchanged with uh, uh, Brunei, you know, by uh, the former prime minister. This is during the time of the Badawi administration. Correct. Yep. All these actually require consent of the state legislative assembly because that's part of the continental shelf. Mm. Now, as far as I know, none of these have actually gone through. It was never debated, but it was just exchanged and given away. So there is uh, grounds for that. Okay? But whether or not you satisfy those requirements, whether there's actually evidence for that, then it depends to be seen. Because a lot of the things that we are talking about now is just only in the public realm. What actually happened? What were the behind the scene thing? We would know because those would be official secrets. So if you are going to litigate this, you are going to have a problem uh, to deal with this evidence. So there are certain evidence which you have, certain evidence which you don't have. But the actual act of litigation will force the government to release some of the internal papers, right? Correct. Uh, there, are, ah, there is precedent for doing that. Like, for example, when there was, there was a group of cons uh, water consumers in Selangor who wanted to challenge the privatization of Shabas. And the Court of Appeal says, yes, you can have those papers. So there are grounds for that and there is precedent for that. And uh, the, the Court of Appeal has been quite uh, liberal in dealing with these sort of things. So if you have a proper plaintiff and you have a sufficient ground to make sure that it's not a doomed to failure sort of case, 
then you have a good chance of success. And once you have that, then you will be able to have other documents. Now, the other thing that concerns a lot of Sabahan, of course, is the issue of the PTI. Uh, PTI is, of course, uh, if you look at the three schedule, uh, citizenship, border controls, defense, that's a purely federal list. Uh, but despite that, uh, we know that uh, Sabah's population of demography has completely changed since the 70s. Uh, the only way to explain it is that there's been a large influx of people. Uh, you walk around Katakan Balu, it's very obvious that uh, the large influx come from uh, southern part of the Philippines and some of them are from Indonesia. Is there a way you can litigate on this issue or because it's on the uh, federal schedule as a federal power that uh, there was no legal remedy to this issue? Okay, on the PTI side, I think that it would actually be a combination of both the state's uh, administrative power and also whether or not the state is, is going to uh, willing to go the further step to actually uh, challenge the federal government on that. Because the state's powers are there. Okay. In the case of Suguma Balakrishna, the High Court and the Federal Court had the chance to look at all this and they say that the Chief Minister has that power. Now, then you have the question of why is not the Chief Minister exercising those powers? Then you come down again to say that uh, the Chief Minister has to direct the, the Director of Immigration, who is actually most of the time is a West Malaysian uh, uh, person. So you have all these questions which if you have to litigate, you have to make sure that all those parcel of rights comes within that particular section of the law. That's why I say that we are talking about it, but at the end of the day, you must look at the question, who is the plaintiff? Because you have to fit all those things into that plaintiff. Because if you don't, your plaintiff will be knocked out on the very first step. Well, in this case, the plaintiff obviously is the Ministry of Home Affairs that issues uh, uh, identity cards and, and, and giving them access to Malaysian citizenship, isn't it? That's what no, the, the no, normal people are saying. That would be the defendant. But who is going to be your plaintiff to actually go and file that to say that his rights has been infringed or has been uh, deprived because of the lack of action by... No, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm thinking of the case of uh, Dr. Chong. As you know, Dr. Chong has, has, has uh, previously uh, published lists of people he claims to, to be given, uh, the IC and, and several other people. I think they did try to file a court case. Am I right? But the case never went anywhere? Or am, I'm am not I too sure. I'm not too sure about Dr. Chong. Mm. Uh, but I remember he wrote a book. That's right. I wrote a book, seen a lot of the data that he wrote which shows all these things which the uh, federal government should have done. Mm. But then, you see, if you do that, it's a question of the minister's administrative powers. You see, if you go into the administrative realm, the ordinary citizen has got very little area to go and challenge that unless you fall within the, the limited scope of uh, challenge against the exercise of administrative power or based on grounds uh, broadly of what we call Venus Fury unreasonableness. Mm, mm. So you, you have very limited grounds if it is dealing with administrative law. And also in the way most of the acts are written in Malaysia, there's always a clause that says the minister has absolute discretion. No, even that you can challenge it. Uh, oh, I think okay. Kapal, Kapal Singh has on many occasions challenged those. In fact, he was one of those first who use constitutional law to be a basis to go and challenge the validity of a lot of these laws. Mm. Now, there are also some people argue that this whole issue of federal-state relationship, especially uh, federal-state relationship, uh, uh, sorry, there are also many people who, who argue that this issue of federal-state relationship when it comes to Sabah is essentially a political issue because uh, Sabah's political development, unlike Sarah, has not been as stable. Uh, there were long periods in Sabah where the state government has been in opposition to the federal government and that the federal government has taken a hard line towards uh, Sabah. And therefore, if you want uh, a, a resolution to this MSC3 issue, uh, forget about the legal route. Uh, you have to follow the political route. What, what, what is your, your opinion on this issue? Well, whether or not it is a polit political solution or not, I wouldn't know. Uh, but the fact is that 
if you look at what has been done over the past uh, uh, decades, the political solution has never been a solution. So uh, I'm only looking at it strictly as a legal issue. Mm -hmm. That means if I have a plaintiff, do I, does he have the right to go and challenge? And if so, how to go about it so that his challenge does not get thrown out at the first instance? That means he doesn't even get to have his merits heard. Mm -hmm. So the issue of whether or not the, uh, it's a political solution, uh, I have done some, compare, uh, some research on some articles regarding the sharing of revenue between uh, Canada, uh, Australia and Germany, how they deal with it. And a lot of their constitution also have the same provisions like the Sabah, whereby we get 40%. But a lot of that is changed over the years because the formula is very, very vague. But what they do is that they actually uh, negotiate their way around it and find a solution. Now, in the case of Sabah, you must remember, uh, we are the only state, I think, that has got changed of government so many times. No other state in Malaysia has got that distinction. Okay? Then you, you must also realize that the federal government is not sitting there doing nothing. They have an army of lawyers to look at all these problems. So the fact that a lot of these things which are in the state list, like for example, the 40% has not been changed over all these years, shows that they really know something that we don't know. So if we actually do litigate, we must be prepared to surmount all these problems. So uh, the Attorney General's office is a formidable opponent because they have got so much resources so it's not going to be a walk in the park. Whoever is going to litigate must be prepared to stay the course. And this is where I say that the uh, legal process is something that it should be considered because in anything else, uh, you will not be dealing as among equals. But when you go to court, you may be an individual, but the court will still listen to you as long as you come within the parameter of the rights and within the parameters of the law, everybody will be treated as equal, even though you are dealing with the federal government. But if you can see, if you can argue that the right has been uh, has been infringed, the court will grant you. All right. Well, I think our time is up. Well, thank you very much, Roland. I think you have raised a lot of interesting thank issues. You.